What is up fellow nerds and welcome back to the Dapper Snapper Gaming Channel and welcome to our very first Dungeons and Dragons video here on the channel. Now today we're going to be starting a brand new series called How Do I Want to Do This? And this is going to be all about character creation. We're going to be going through every possible character creation option presented in all official works in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and rating each of their individual powers and classes and subclasses on a scale of one to 10. We'll be ranking the classes versus each other and the subclasses versus the other subclasses within their specified class. So if you're excited to learn all there is about character creating options in Dungeons and Dragons, make sure to leave a like in the video and subscribe if you haven't already. We're gonna be putting out all kinds of these videos as there are a ton of possible playable options and in later episodes we are going to be covering the subclasses and we will be actually building characters in the video for you to use at your game table possibly so down in the comments below make sure to let me know what kind of dungeons and dragons content you would like to see in the future whether it is rules whether it is um, how i call certain things as a dm if it is character creation options that can be there to just mess up your DM or optimization for crazy amounts of damage, all the good things. So just let me know in the comments down below what you would like to see in the future. So let's go ahead and jump into our very first class we're gonna be covering, the Artificer. Now the Artificer was introduced in Eberron Rising from the Last War and then reprinted in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything here recently. Um, it wasn't really covered all that well when it was released in Eberron, but once it reached Tasha's, it has picked up a lot in popularity, and it is the only class to ever be added after the initial release of the Player's Handbook in 5th edition, making it very unique um, in that it's the only one that's come past the initial release, uh, which is really, really cool. This class allows you to do some really, really cool things and it allows you to be that support character that creates magic items rather than necessarily always having to buy or find them. You can make them yourself in a pretty reliable way and then either use them for yourself or hand them out to your party. So if this is something that you have been wanting to do at your table, this is your ticket and this is how you do it. Um, it's cool and it's done really, really well. So let's take a look at what the Artificer gets in its kit. So first of all, we get a D8 hit die, which is the second worst in the game, but in fairness, there's only one class that gets the best and worst, which are Barbarian and Wizard respectively. So, you know, it's not the worst thing that it could be, but it is not a D10, and so that's definitely a little bit lacking, but we'll make it work, not a huge deal. Next, we get proficiency with light and medium armor, as well as shields. Notice we do not get heavy armor, unfortunately, so that is a bit of a minus. Um, having that versatility of being able to use heavy armor on any artificer would definitely be nice. However, once we talk about the second subclass added on this uh, on this list, you'll see why we don't have heavy armor as part of the class. But it does take away from the class as a whole, as the other three do not get it. So, unfortunately, no heavy armor here. We also get simple weapons as well as thieves tools and tinkers tools and another tool of your choice. Now, one thing that they tried really hard to do with this class is make tools relevant. Did it work? No. And the reason is just because you give a bunch of proficiencies to this class doesn't mean it makes the tools any better. It makes you better at using these tools the one time that it will come up. Uh, tools are very underpowered and underutilized in fifth edition. Um, you're not gonna use them very often. There are there are very, very few chances that you're ever gonna get to use this, this power. Um, and once we also get our level three ability, you know, you can start switch, switching out these, these tools for other tools. It's still not great though, just because of how the core mechanics of fifth edition are designed as far as tools. So unfortunately, while this is good having versatility, the tools themselves aren't really going to do all that much for you. So that's unfortunate. 
For saving throws, we get constitution and intelligence. Now, constitution is probably the best one that we could get as a spellcaster. Um, sp constitution is fantastic for maintaining concentration on key spells such as heat metal and haste. Just to name a couple of these really good spells that we're going to look at on our spell list here in just a second. But yeah, maintaining concentration is fantastic. So constitution, fantastic save and throw to have. The other one is intelligence, which is possibly the worst one that we could have. There are only three spells that really come to my mind that you may or may not see during the course of your campaign. And those are Phantasmal Force, Symbol, and Feeble Mind that require an intelligence saving throw. You're not going to run into these all that often, and when you do, you're going to be like, wow, I wish I had that. And then the rest of the time, you're going to wish that it was wisdom. Now, obviously, it's intelligence because you're an intelligence-based character. It makes sense with the flavor, I understand. But as far as a mechanical standpoint, wisdom would have been much better letting you benefit versus all of these spells. Yeah, there's a couple. There's a lot. Um, yeah, it would be nice to have wisdom saving throws instead of intelligence. But you take what you can get. Constitution is still amazing, so we'll take that. Finally, we come to our skill proficiencies, and we get any two from this list. Pretty standard uh, from any of the classes. You get a big list, and you get to take two of them. Now, personally, I would take Perception and Investigation, as those are going to come up pretty often. At least they do at my table. Now, if you do get Perception from your race, possibly, if you are an elf or if you get it from your background or anything like that, then maybe you want to choose something like Nature. I think nature is incredibly relevant for exploration purposes. And then medicine as well. Medicine can come up a decent amount. Um, and you actually have a really strong case for taking Arcana on this list as well. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit later about crafting magic items. And specifically talking about magic items that are not on your infusion list. Which we will also talk about here in just a second. When you create those, having a high Arcana modifier can be actually really really nice and so arcana may actually be one that you take otherwise normally people don't take arcana outside of wizards this could be another another argument to take it so just another one to consider so overall i'm going to give these proficiencies a six out of ten we are missing several key things such as heavy armor we don't have that um, and and even if you aren't going to take it having the versatility to take it is really really good now there is a reason and when we talk about the armorer subclass obviously that's the, the the big use for it but as far as the base class we don't get it um, so you can't crank your ac so high with armor alone if you're going to crank the ac you're going to have to find some other means of doing so um, so you know you just can't rely on your armor specifically for that um, next we have intelligence saving throws which are yeah, pretty bad and by pretty bad I mean it's terrible you know being feeble-minded is really really bad being a vegetable for like a month is really really bad but the rest of the time that you're in combat and you're taking all of these spells and you could wish that you had wisdom like 90% of the rest of the campaign yeah you're gonna wish that you had wisdom instead of intelligence it is what it is and finally <sighs> all of the tool proficiencies that we get. Now, Thieves Tools are great. This gives you the ability to possibly be the lockpick person instead of your rogue, which normally is what the rogue does. But like, besides that, who cares? Um, because like I said, outside of the Thieves Tools being able to pick locks, the rest of the tools really don't come up all that often. And they're really underpowered in what they can do. They're really vague in what they can do. Um, and the rules are just really, really clunky for them. So unfortunately, having all these proficiencies is just kind of neat, but it's not really super useful, at least not at my tables. They don't really come up. Um, if you're wanting to get something done and you don't have the tool for it, typically there's somebody around if you're near a town and you can fix it. Um, and you can you can create what you need to create or or, or anything like that. Like it's 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 not gonna come up enough to where I think that it's super worth it. And so, yeah, outside of these tools, the tool proficiencies, I could just kind of take them or leave them. All right, so now that we have proficiencies in all of our base features, 
Let's see what we actually get when we take this class at level one. At level one, we get two features, one being magical tinkering. So what this does is it allows you to touch a tiny object and actually put a little bit of magic into it to produce one of four effects that you're seeing here on your screen. Now you can do this to a number of objects equal to your intelligence modifier. And you know, this class has been out for a while and I still haven't found a good way to use this. It doesn't really come up to where you're gonna need a light that only goes five feet bright and another five feet dim, or making tiny sounds, or having a recorded message. Like, it's very limiting in what it can do. As far as the way I read it, you have to record the message yourself, so you can't record somebody else doing the message, so you're limited in that way. Um, it lighting a tiny bit away is not going to help people with dark vision. It's just going to be a tiny distraction. It doesn't really help. So yeah, I haven't found a good reason for any of these powers yet. And so I'm just going to have to give it a one out of 10. It doesn't do anything in my opinion. It doesn't do anything worthwhile. At first level, we also get spell casting. Now spell casting is what allows us to, of course, cast our spells and use our magic. We are the creators of magical items after all. And so spell casting is only a natural uh, consequence of that. Now, this is a little interesting because we get only up to fifth level spells. We're considered what's called a half caster, similar to the Eldritch Knight and so our spells come online much, much slower than that of other full casters. So compared to the wizard, the wizard's casting haste pretty early on. You're waiting another five or six levels before you're going to be able to take haste. And so, yeah, the progression is kind of painfully slow. So just keep that in mind. Your class is very slow when it comes to the progression of your spells. Um, another limitation to your spell casting is going to be the number of cantrips that you get. You only get four from levels one to 20, which is very, very low. Cantrips are very nice for either on-demand damage or on-demand utility. And so not having that much as far as options goes is a really, really detrimental factor to this. Now you can help it out slightly with both feats and certain races that you take. Certain races will let you take a cantrip and then something like Magic Initiate will let you take a cantrip. And so that's something to definitely consider and we will talk about that much more in our build videos and ranking videos of the subclasses. Again, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of those. But yeah, that's another big limitation. One good thing though, is that we are similar to clerics in that we get to prepare a number of spells per day and we can swap those out every single day. If we like a spell for that specific day, if we have a little bit of foresight and are like, well, I'm gonna need this spell today, may not need it tomorrow, well, you can just drop it the next day and you don't have to worry about it. We also actually get ritual casting, which is really good. So any spell that can be cast as a ritual, you can take just a little bit longer to cast it and not use up a spell slot. So. That's also really good, giving you a little bit of versatility with casting things such as Alarm. Um, so you can cast it as a, uh, as a ritual. Even if you are out of spell slots, you can still cast the spell, which is pretty cool. That gives you a little bit, a little bit more versatility as compared to somebody who doesn't. Overall though, the spell casting on the Artificer specifically, I'm gonna have to give it a five out of 10 just because, you know, half caster, half the score, and we don't get very many cantrips. So unfortunately, it's not the best, even though the spell list isn't terrible. Um, we definitely have some, some standout options here and there on the spell list, um, but it's mostly utility. Um, there's not a ton of damage on here. There's, there's some, but there's not a ton of damage. It's mostly support. And so, you know, if you're looking for a blaster class specifically, Outside of one of the subclasses, this may not be the one that you're looking for. But, you know, we've got some good options on there. I'm still gonna give it a five out of 10. So at second level, we get the main ability of this class, which is Infuse Item. Infuse Item allows us to actually take a number of infusions from the Artificer Infusions table, which is quite long. And we are not going to go into detail on every single infusion today. That will be a future video. So just another reason to subscribe, right? And you can apply these effects 
to items both that you have or that you can give to a party member, which is really, really cool. Um, now, keep in mind, you always know double the amount of infusions that you can actually have active at a time, but these can be switched out every long rest for other ones that you know, and you can also switch out ones that you know every time that you level up in this class. So, you know, you can always switch stuff out. If you don't like something, then that's fine. This is especially useful since there are certain types of infusions that can be taken multiple times and each count as an individual use, as well as certain ones that are restricted by level. So, you know, you'll have some that will come online at seventh level that you couldn't take at the beginning. And so maybe you want to swap out one of your lower level ones for one of the higher level ones. You can do that and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, you can create certain things such as, now these are just the highlights, but there are a lot of them on here. Uh, plus one and plus two weapons and armor. That's fantastic, just being able to just do that. You're like, well, you have this sword. Well, now it's a plus one or plus two sword. That's fantastic. Um, you have your homunculus servant. So you can create a tiny construct that follows you around. It can also have a flying speed, which is pretty neat. And it can it can do some interesting things. And we'll talk about that in more detail in another video, but it's pretty cool. Um, and then finally, the best thing that's on this list is replicate magic item. So you get this big list of magic items that you can just create as long as you have the materials to create it. And some of the options on here are kind of insane. And I'm just gonna list a couple of them, but like I said, we're gonna go into much more detail in a future video. But you can have a bag of holding at level two, which is crazy. But you can also create things like winged boots and amulets of health. So there are some insane items that you can create here. And it can really, really buff up you and your party. Um, I really don't think that this is a surprise to anyone, but this is a 10 out of 10. This is an absolutely incredible ability and it is super versatile. You can do pretty much whatever you want to do with it. Um, it gives you so many options and most of them are really, really good. So yeah, as long as you're choosing at least decent infusions, you're gonna be really happy with this feature. So at third level, we get access to our subclass. And so this allows you to further specialize in what you want your artificer to do. There are four options for you. You can choose the alchemist, the armorer, the artillerist, or the battlesmith. And so you've got some really, really cool options there. We're gonna talk about each of them in detail in a future video. And so I'm not gonna cover them today at all. Um, but starting next week, we're going to be building an alchemist and going from there, uh, we will be ranking each of their powers and then going on and actually building an alchemist in the same video and providing character sheets for you to use in your home games. So that will help you as far as progression and help you with choosing spells and choosing cantrips and all of those difficult decisions that come with it. I'll give you an example build. And so that'll be really, really fun. So just another reason to subscribe, right? So at third level, you also get the feature right tool for the job. With this, you can spend one hour as a ritual, essentially, turning one type of tools into another type of tools. Now, this does not make them magical. They are just regular tools just sitting there on the ground that you can use. And you do not gain proficiency in these. They are just simply tools that you now have at your disposal. So let's say you're riding along the path and your cart breaks down and you break a wheel and you don't have any way to really fix it. You could spend an hour and create some carpenter's tools and use those. So, you know, the one time that that comes up, cool. You're the hero. You are the absolute bomb.com right there. The rest of the campaign, you're never gonna use this because like I said, outside of your thieves tools, which you already have and you get as your starting equipment, you aren't gonna use tools all that much in D&D 5e. Um, you're gonna pick locks and that's about it. You're not really gonna use any of the other tools all that much unless your dungeon master has other rules that makes them a little bit more useful. But as far as the core rules as written, they're not all that great. Um, I'm gonna give this a five out of 10 just because of the versatility it gives you. 
and the possibility that maybe at your table, your dungeon master is a little bit more forgiving than I am about the tools. But for me, I think tools are just pretty much useless. And so I don't think that this is gonna come up all that much. So at sixth level, you get to double your proficiency bonus with your tools. It's neat, but like I said, with right tool for the job, tools are very vaguely defined and hardly ever used. And so outside of thieves tools, which is great, but you're also just doing expertise like what the rogue does. Um, so basically you're just becoming the rogue and being able to uh, pick locks and, and that sort of thing if you don't have access to a rogue on your team. Besides that, you're really not gonna use this all that much. So, you know, because thieves tools are good, I'm gonna give it a five out of 10. If it was, if you didn't have proficiency with thieves tools already, it probably would be lower. Um, but yeah, like I said, tools are not that great in, in D&D 5e. So unfortunately, you're not gonna see this all that much. At level seven, we get Flash of Genius. Now this is a really interesting ability that allows you to either take a creature that is 30 feet from you or yourself, and when you or that creature makes an ability check or saving throw, you can use your reaction to add your intelligence modifier to that roll. So this is pretty simple, but also very useful at the same time. You know, by the time you're at level seven, typically you would have at least an 18, 19, or a 20 in your intelligence score. And so you're going to be giving out a plus four or a plus five bonus. And so this can be the difference between a failure and a success. And this can become very, very stressful for your DM when you keep passing your saves that you should have failed. Now, keep in mind, this is use of your reaction and this cannot be used on multiple creatures at once. So if you get fireballed by an opposing spellcaster, you might be able to use it on yourself or one other person to help make your deck saving throw, but only the one and it uses your reaction. So keep in mind that this does compete with something like absorb elements, which you are going to want to be using. So definitely make sure that this is what you want to do. But overall, this is pretty useful though. And, and being able to give plus four, plus five to a saving throw could mean the difference between life and death for certain characters. And so I think this is quite useful. Um, it's, it's cool. I think it's an eight out of 10. I would give it more if it was a bigger range, but it's still pretty good. So at 10th level, you get two more abilities. You can now have four magic items attuned rather than three, which is cool. You are the only class that can do this. And so this gives you a lot more versatility in what kind of magic items you can have. Um, and this can be either something that you make with your infusion or that you find or buy along the way in your adventure. So, you know, if you've got something that's a little bit stronger than one of your infusions is, Maybe you can just create your infusions and be giving them out to your party at this point and then be using some of the other stuff that you found along the way for yourself. So this definitely encourages you to want to be more of a team player and give magic items out to your team rather than using them all for yourself. And so I think that it does that. I think that that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that this gets is if you are creating a magic item of common or uncommon rarity, you can create it in a quarter of the time and for half the cost. Now, creating magic items that are not infusions is a very clunky process and it is a very difficult thing to do. Now, obviously you're an artificer, it's what you do. But outside of infusions, this is very complicated and clunky and not very well written out and defined in the core rules and so yes this is helpful but it's going to depend a lot on your dm um, your dm is going to be the one that determines how useful this is how long it takes you to create things how much it costs if you have to go on specific search quests for these items or if you can find everything in town. It's it's going to be very different based on how your DM decides to have you create certain magic items. So this power, I'm, I'm going to give it a nine out of 10 because having a fourth attunement slot is great and having this versatility, I mean, it's not bad. It's only helpful here, 
but it could be more helpful at certain tables than it could be at others. And so I just want you to keep that in mind. Could be better at certain tables, could be a 10 out of 10, but it also could be somewhere less than that. So just keep that in mind. So we'll make, let's call it nine out of 10 with an asterisk next to it. So at 11th level, you get spell storing item. Now this is a really cool ability in which you can take an, a weapon of either simple or martial properties or a weapon that you are using as your spellcasting focus, which you can do with your infusions, and you can put a spell of first or second level in it. It can then be cast a number of times equal to twice your intelligence modifier, and if there is concentration to be had, then it counts toward the caster. Otherwise, it uses your spellcasting ability and saving throws, and so, yeah, essentially you're casting extra spells. This can get kind of interesting because one, it does not say that you have to cast the spell and use the spell slot in order to put the spell into the weapon. It also says that you do not have to have this spell prepared. So this can be a spell that you didn't bring and you can put it in an item. So you could have your, say, crossbow. You have a light crossbow, maybe you have repeating shot on it. And so it is a magical item you're using as your spellcasting focus. So you can then put a first or second level spell in it and use that to concentrate on a spell or just cast a spell that is not prepared on your list. So that's pretty cool. However, I think that using it that way is a trap. I think that the way to do this is to give this to someone else. It does not say that the person who activates this has to be you or even a spellcaster. It says someone can use it. So this should be used on non-spellcasters, on your barbarians, on your fighters, on your things that are not using magic, basically. And this allows them to concentrate on spells while you're also concentrating on spells. Now, there are quite a few really, really good options for doing this. Now, just these are just some of the top hits for me, but you can do Cure Wounds, Fairy Fire, Grease, Aid, Blur, Heat Metal, Invisibility, Rope Trick, Spider Climb, and Web. And of course, there are others. Now, you are limited that the casting time does have to be in action, so no Absorb Elements or anything like that, unfortunately but there's still a lot of really good options on this list. Now, the reason they didn't do third level or higher is because no haste or fly. I wish that we could do haste and fly because that would be absolutely insane, but we don't get it, so it's fine. It is what it is. Um, if we had those third level spells, it would be a 10 out of 10. Otherwise, I'm gonna say this is a nine out of 10. Essentially, you can concentrate on two spells at once. You're allowing someone who probably has a really good constitution score, being your frontline fighter, be the one who is casting the spell and concentrating on it. This can be really nice, especially for something like web, um, even spider climb. You know, you've now got a fighter that can just climb on walls, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, you've got invisibility. You can now have invisibility on something that normally wouldn't be able to be invisible, um, and you could be then casting invisibility on yourself or a different party member. So you can have two invisibilities at a, at once when normally it wouldn't be possible. So the, the implications here are absolutely fantastic and there is so much room for creative play here. So yeah, nine out of 10, if it was higher level, it'd be 10 out of 10, but this is, this is a great ability. So at 14th level, you get the ability to attune to a fifth magic item which of course is always a good thing and you also get to ignore all race class level and spell requirements on these magic items then at 18th level you get a sixth item that you can attune to so overall eight out of ten it's it's good it's really good having six magic items that you can attune to is fantastic it's always going to be a good thing that you can have more and more things so now you've got you know a hat you've got the ring you've got the boots you've got the bracers you've got the armor you've got the staff you've got all these different things that you can that you can have attuned at once and just be doing an insane 
combination of all kinds of different magic things that you found throughout your journey. I mean, you're level 18 by this point. You found, I'm sure, some insanely strong magic items. And so, yeah, the, the implications here of being able to have six items attuned at a time, it's kind of nuts. You can go absolutely wild with this. So finally at level 20, we get our capstone ability, which is Soul of Artifice. Now this ability is a little interesting, um, but it's pretty good, at least most of the time. And so let's go ahead and talk about it. So you do get a plus one to all saving throws equal to the number of magic items that you are attuned to. So by this point, it should be six. You're at level 20 and you have six slots. I would say you should be attuned to six different things right now. So you have a plus six to all of your saving throws. And this is in addition to proficiency bonus to anything else that you have. Uh, yeah, this can be really, really helpful. It's really, really nice. So definitely a cool thing. The other ability, however, is where things get interesting. It is if you are dropped to zero HP and not killed outright, you can use your reaction to end one of your infusions and rise back up to one HP instead. Now, by 20th level, you have six active infusions at a time. You know 12, you have six active. They aren't all necessarily on you, so you might have given these out to the party at the time. So you have to really start weighing your options here, as do I go ahead and deactivate the plus two sword that I gave my fighter in order for me to stay at, at one hit point? Or do I just let myself drop and let the cleric pick me back up and then I'm still good? Do I get rid of my magic crossbow that I've been using as my uh, spellcasting focus? Is that something I can afford to, to drop? Um, so you've gotta be really, really careful with what you choose here. Um, now, so you do have six options. If you're an armorer, you have eight. And so this can be really, really strong. And again, makes the armor a little bit stronger just for this class feature alone. But it's a bit of a trap because your infusions are your entire core ability, right? And so if you start dropping all of your infusions, you know, if you've got winged boots on and you drop your infusion, you're going to fall and take a bunch of damage depending on how high up you are. So, you know, you've got to really weigh those options out and think about what infusions are absolutely necessary and if there are any that you can afford to drop at the time. So this definitely can be a trap and I want you to know that that's there. Um, and so you just you just have to really think about before you use that. Um, it is it is definitely not something to just use as a knee jerk reaction to keep yourself alive. You definitely want to still be relying on your cleric to heal you and and that sort of thing right there. So just just keep that in mind when you're using this ability. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. It's not a 10 out of 10 because there is the trap involved because it could force you into making a bad decision. And so I have to give it an 8 out of 10 for that. So overall, let's let's take a look at everything here. So the Artificer is pretty solid overall and adds a lot of versatility and utility to this character build. Um, as will be the case in all of my rating videos, early abilities are going to trump the higher level ones. And this is because the higher level you go, the less likely it is that your campaign will even last that long. So, you know, you may play this class and never even see the 14th level ability. And so, you know, we do have a lot of really good higher level abilities here, but I've got to give this class an overall of a seven out of 10. The reason being because outside of your infusions, you really don't start having these great abilities until level 10, kind of level seven with Flash of Genius, but yeah, outside of the infusions, you don't have a lot of power there. And then you've kind of got a dead spot there in the middle before you hit the higher level abilities. So definitely something to consider there. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough. Flash of Genius can be good in saving your life, but it's a little limited in how many times you can use it and it competes with your reaction to use something like absorb elements and so you know it, it can cause a little bit of interesting a little bit of an interesting clash there 
Um, the extra attunement slots are great and allow you to be able to customize your character that much more. But, you know, again, you've got to be relying on those items for pretty much everything because you're not going to be the primary damage dealer. You're going to be the utility character that is handing out magic items and buffing everybody and buffing yourself and just helping the party out in general. Um, and finally, the Soul of Artifice power, which 90% of tables are never even going to see, ends up being a trap some of the time. If you end some of the infusions that maybe you shouldn't have ended, um, if it will end up putting you in a bad position later. So, you know, you can leave those going and then just let yourself be knocked to zero HP and then get right back up with some kind of healing. So definitely something to think about. But yeah, I think seven out of 10 is more than fair on this class. I, I think that it definitely has some shortcomings, but it's also got some really strong options. And it's so it's it's cool. It's great. I definitely recommend playing one. So that has been our look at the Artificer class. Now, starting next week, we're going to be looking at each of the subclasses introduced for this class. And so we're going to be building all of those as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, of course, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of that. Um, I'm glad that they added this into the game. This is better late than never. Having a 13th class added into the game, it adds a lot of really, really cool versatility and just options. And options are always a good thing, right? So I hope that you will go out there and have so much fun with building one of these artificers. And we will be building one together starting next week with the Alchemist and going from there. So again, make sure you leave a like on the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave me a comment down below letting me know what kind of D&D content you would like to see in the future. Until then, we'll see you later. Have a good one. Bye-bye.